Good morning and welcome to Computer Science 221. We will be getting a new chapter today. Uh, the chapter is Chapter 8. It has to do with um, I.O. This is a very interesting topic. Um, we've talked about it before a little bit. Um, so I'm going to first just talk about um, what are the difficulties of I.O. So number one, I want to consider what are the difficulties? Why is this such a hard thing? And we talked about this a little bit before uh, when we introduced the whole notion of traps. Um, we said that I.O. was kind of tricky and as a programmer you don't want to be stuck having to write I.O. routines all the time. So typically the manufacturer is going to provide that code to you in the form of a trap and all you have to do is, is invoke the particular trap that you want. So, um, amongst the difficulties, I will say that um, the first one is uh, the software is difficult. Software is complicated. Um, and again, the idea here is, is that now all of a sudden you have um, these devices, all sorts of different kinds of devices that are communicating with the computer. For example, consider, consider Wi-Fi. So first of all, if you want to understand how to communicate with Wi-Fi, you have to have some knowledge of radio. Um, something I don't particularly have, and I know a lot of people don't. So you need to know some knowledge of radio. And um, I don't have it, but I'm still able to use Wi-Fi. I'm able to write programs that take advantage of Wi-Fi. That is because the Wi-Fi, the people that put the Wi-Fi card in my computer have provided me with the code to do it. And those were written by people that um, do have knowledge of radio. Um, but, you know, think about all the different other kinds of uh, devices that you could have hooked up to your computer. You could have a printer. You can have a display. You can have a sound card. Um, there are all sorts of different um, devices here. Um, each one of them would probably require a detailed knowledge um, of electrical engineering. To fully understand how to communicate with these things um, and how to write the proper software that lets you interface with, with your computer. So, um, complicated issue. The other thing that has to do with these is, is I'm going to talk about differences in speed. Okay, so your computer, your CPU, is working on the order of nanoseconds. And remember when we talk about nanoseconds, nano means a billionth. One billionth. Pretty quick, okay? But when we're talking about um, here, another device we could have put over here is the keyboard. Um, I'm not a particularly fast typist. I think in my wildest dreams I could probably type, I don't know, five to ten characters per second. Okay, so over here you've got a keyboard that is um, inputting things to the computer at the rate of five to ten in a second, but we've got a thing over here um, that can actually process billions of them in a second. Or consider the case of a, so this would be the keyboard. Consider a printer. Um, I think, you know, the fastest printer could probably output um, somewhere between 100 and 1,000 characters per second. But again, realize that um, the computer could be pumping things into the printer. In theory, could be pumping a million of them or a billion of them in a second. So there are, these are extreme um, orders of magnitude over here, the differences between them. So part of the problem that you have is um, trying to synchronize synchronize slow I.O. devices with the fast CPU. 
and that is another problem that you have um, performing I.O. So these are the issues that we need to consider here, okay? Okay. In its very simplest form, an I.O. device And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say a simple model. And we're going to see that the simple model applies to the LC3. And the simple model gets a little bit more complicated on um, real computers like you're watching right now. But in its simplest form, you will see that an I.O. device will have what are called, it'll have two device registers. And that is a two, in case you can't read it, two. And these device registers will be broken up. One of them is a status register, and one of them is an actual buffer for transfer. And when I say here, buffer for transfer, this is the thing that actually transfers information back and forth between the device and the CPU of the computer. Sometimes this thing may be going this way in the case of a keyboard. Sometimes it's going that way in the case of a printer. Sometimes it can go both ways in the case of a disk drive. Um, but we've got these two status registers. And I guess what I'd like to do is just present this in the term in terms of, say, a printer. So here is my printer. Um, it's sitting right over here. And over here is my computer. So here's the computer. And over here is my printer. And maybe this thing over here can output characters at the rate of 100 characters per second. So the computer knows that. Um, and we said the computer can generate billions of characters per second, but it knows it can only put things out here one a hundred at a time. So maybe what we do here, and this is a very contrived example, but you'll get it over here. There is a buffer, and maybe this buffer is big enough to hold a hundred characters. Okay, and um, up here, there is just a bit, a status bit. And the whole idea here is, is the following. The computer has a whole lot of characters that it wants to send to the printer. And what it does is, is it will only send characters to the printer when this is a one, okay? If there's a zero in here, what that means is, is that the printer is busy printing stuff out and please don't send any stuff over because the printer is using the 100 characters that are currently in here. When the printer is done printing out all those 100 characters, what the printer will do is, is it will set this status bit to a 1. And now the computer sees that there's a one, it says, okay, I can now send over a hundred more characters. Now the computer is sitting there and it's got lots more characters to do, um, but it can only put them out there one, a hundred at a time. So you can see what's going on here is, is we're making use of these two different, okay, device registers here. And there may be more to the status register than just one bit, okay? There may be lots of different bits to indicate different states that the printer could be in. Uh, maybe it needs another ink cartridge. Uh, there could be a lot of things in here. But we can see that we have to use this status bit to sort of communicate information back and forth here. I believe your author refers to this as a handshake. That makes the I.O. possible. Okay, so now there is an interesting efficiency question to ask here. And what I want to do is, is I want to assume for the second 
um, that we're the CPU. And we're the CPU, and we have lots of characters to print. So we know that there is this thing over here. I'm going to call it printer.status. Okay, and we know that um, if this thing is a zero, don't send characters. And we know that if it's one, okay to send another 100 characters. So what the computer, what is the computer gonna do? Well, one thing that the computer can do is, is it can do what's called polling. It can pull, pull the status bit. And it basically can say something like the, like the following. Um, think of it this way. It would say, while printer.status um, and equal equal zero and I'm just going to make this an empty loop okay so what we're doing in here is is we're continually checking to see if the printer status is zero and as long as it's zero we stay, we stay in this loop and we don't do anything and then once we exit the loop, once we get down here, that means that the printer status has been one, and we can say something like send 100 chars to printer.buffer. And we could actually do the following. We could say do while more chars to print. And what we do over here, notice that what's going on over here. This process over here, this is what we call polling. And what we are doing is, is we're in a very tight loop here where we keep pulling the status, okay, or the value of a particular register, okay, or bit. Um, and as long as this thing is zero, we stay in here and we keep doing this. Now, when I talk about polling, um, I actually like to talk about the idea, and you've probably heard this story before, um, that one of you has said to me in class that you're going to call me up at 7 o'clock tonight. And what would happen is, is maybe I get home at 10 minutes to 7, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, you're going to call me at 7 o'clock tonight. So what I do is, is I go over to my phone, and I continually, I just pick the phone up, and I go, hello? And there's nobody there, so I hang it up. And I pick it up again, and I go, hello? and there's nobody there, and I hang it up. And I keep doing this until finally on the other end, somebody says, hello. Um, that's what polling is. I am polling the phone to see if there's a call coming in. Now, I think you would all grant me that that's actually a very inefficient thing to do. Um, what's wrong with this thing over here is that the computer may have lots of other things to do. Maybe it's downloading a file, maybe it's updating a spreadsheet, um, but the point is, is, is it's not doing any of that if it's sitting here in some tight loop where it's continually checking the status of a register. So the other thing that you can do other than poll So there is polling. The other thing is what's called an interrupt. And I think you would follow the analogy just fine. 
I get home from work at 10 minutes to 7. Um, I know that a student has told me they're going to call at 7 o'clock, but hey, they're students. They really could call at 10 minutes after 7 or maybe even 8 o'clock. Um, and I say to myself, well, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and cook dinner um, and watch a movie. Um, so I'm sitting there doing all sorts of things that I want to do, and then all of a sudden the phone rings. Ring. What this is, is, is this is an interrupt. And basically what I do, I was in some loop here, if you will. And I'm going to call this the doing something loop. Okay, but at some point there was an interrupt. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say interrupt. And when the interrupt occurs, I'm going to go, I have over here a couple of things I'm going to say here. I need to save the state of the machine. I have to handle the interrupt. Okay, now handling the interrupt in this particular case means I go over to the phone, I pick it up, I go, hello. It's someone from class. They want to know what time is the test tomorrow. I go, seven o'clock. I hang up the phone. And then what I need to do is I need to restore the machine. And now that I'm done with that, I come back and I pick up just where I left off. Now, this whole thing of saving the state of the machine and restoring the state of the machine, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail. Let's suppose that when I got home from school, I am cooking a recipe and I'm cooking a recipe to make chicken cordon bleu. And I get out my Art of French Cooking by Julia Child and I look up the chicken cordon bleu, and there it's a regular old recipe. It's got a bunch of steps in it. Three, four, five. And you come over here and it says mix this, and then it says heat that, and then it says add this. And there's a whole lot of stuff going on here. <clears throat> and I am in I am in the middle of this recipe, and at some point, so you could think of this, this is my loop over here. What happens is, is the phone rings. Now the phone rings just after I finished this step right here. So what I do is, is I pick up a pencil and I put a little mark in there like that. And what that is doing is, is that is saving the state of the machine. What that means <clears throat> is, is I have completed all of these steps. Okay, now I have to go answer the phone. I answer the phone. I do whatever is required to me of answer uh, from the person on the other end. And now when I hang the phone up, I come back to my cookbook and I go here. This is where I have to pick up where I left off. That's called restoring the machine. Okay, saving the state of the machine was recording the fact that there, here is where I'm going to come back to after the phone call. I go and answer the phone, that's handling the interrupt, and then when I'm done with the phone call, I come back here and I pick this up right over here. So we're going to see later on, and we're going to discuss interrupts later, what generally happens in interrupts. Well, the first most important thing of interrupts is you need to save the PC. Okay, we need to know where do we pick up execution when we're done with the interrupt. The other thing that's pretty important, and I'll ask you to think about this, is, is we need to save the flags. And I hope that's pretty clear. Suppose I was executing my program, and I say something like the following. I say add R1, R2, 
R3. And then I come over here and I say branch positive. Suppose an interrupt occurs right over here. It occurs in between these two things. So what that means is, is at this point right over here, I am going to jump and I am going to hand, I'm going to handle my interrupt. Now, who knows what's going on in my interrupt handler? There could be lots of things that are going on and there could be lots of things that are going to change the flags. When I come back, who knows, the positive flag may have been set in here that had nothing to do with this ad over here. So the whole idea of what I need to do over here when I say save, save the state of the machine is that I better save the PC and I better save the flags. And when I'm done with the interrupt, okay, the restore the machine, better restore the flags so that when I come over here and I say branch positive, this is branch positive is based on the results of this instruction over here. So that's the difference between polling and interrupts. And believe it or not, computers are going to do both of them. The beauty of interrupts, of course, is that the machine is not wasting a lot of resources polling. But a lot of times polling is very quick, it's very simple, and in certain situations it is actually implemented. Now the other question, and we're not going to talk about this now, um, but we're going to come back to this, is as I said, we need to save these two things. We need to save the PC and we need to save the flags. And the big question is, is where do you save them? And that's a question we're going to have to answer later on. So the question here is, where are these saved? And we will talk about that later. OK, let's continue our discussion. A um, few points to bring up here. My cursor does not seem to be working. There it is. Okay. Um, so how does the computer talk? That looks kind of weird, doesn't it? talk to the device registers. And there were, there were two methods. Okay, so one is there are dedicated instructions. And how does the dedicated instructions work? Um, typically, there is you you have what are called ports. Ports correspond to specific device registers. For example the manufacturer mate of your computer would come back and say, well, port zero, port zero might be printer status. And then it might come back and they might say something like port one is printer buffer. And then they might come back and they might say port two is the keyboard status and this list can be quite long and then there are typically there are instructions that might look something like this there might be called what's called in p and out p so i might say in p port 23 and i might specify a register here r6 Okay, and what this would be saying is it would be saying, look at port number 23. I don't know what it is. I'd have to go back to my list and get whatever is in there and transfer it into, into register R6. 
The other one, so this would be for reading up reading a port. And then out here we might say output to port 19 R5. So this would be writing to a port. So what we're doing in this particular thing over here is, is first of all we have to create this things of ports that has that has hardware ramifications there. And then we have these two instructions, in P and out P. The other way of doing this, and this may strike you as strange, but it's actually more common than you think, and it's what the LC3 does, is, is we do what's called memory mapped memory. Memory. I'm having trouble here. I'm having trouble with my memory. No pun intended. Memory mapped I.O. And what happens here is, is um, what we do is, is we actually map physical memory addresses to actual device registers. Okay. Um, for example, we're going to see later on on the LC3, I don't remember the exact numbers, I think it's something like hex FFE0. Um, I think that might be the, the display status register. And I'm putting a question mark there because I'm not sure. But the point is, is, is that actual physical memory corresponds to a device register. Now, what is the advantage of that? Advantages of memory mapped I.O. And one is no new instructions. Okay, we can just use loads and stores for accessing um, these devices. Okay, we don't need um, special things for doing in P and out P like we did over here. Okay. Um, what are the disadvantages? Okay. It uses up memory. In other words, memory allocated for memory mapped I.O. You can't use it for anything else. So is that really a problem? Well, I guess it depends on the computer. If you've got computers with, with gigabytes of RAM, I doubt you're going to miss a few bytes of RAM missing. If, on the other hand, you have a, a computer that only has a couple of hundred bytes of RAM, then that could make a difference. Um, the LC3, it doesn't prove to really be a problem, um, even though we only have a limitation of 64,000 bytes of, of uh, 64,000 words of memory. Um, the LC3 still uses memory map I/O. Okay, in this first section of chapter eight, there's just one other topic that needs discussion, and that is the idea of what's called synchronous I/O. versus asynchronous. Okay, and you're going to see that for most devices, for many devices, 
asynchronous is really the way you go. You may remember that when we, at the beginning of this lecture, this video, we talked about that there was going to be a buffer. We talked about the example of the printer. And over here was the print buffer. And over here was the printer status. And what would happen is if I had, we said that this buffer was 100 characters. Um, so the question is about the asynchronous part of it is, is I, I asked you the following question. Suppose I had 1,000 characters to output. And when I say I, I means the CPU. The CPU. Have one hundred have a thousand chars to print, and the question is: Is how long does this take? And the answer is: I don't know. The reason why I don't know is I'm going to put 100 characters into this buffer. I still have 900 to go. And then I have to sit here and wait for the printer status to change to indicate that it's okay to put another 100 characters there. I don't know how long that's going to take. Um, you may say, oh, but printers operate at a certain speed. Well, I, I don't know what that speed is. And I don't think that they're guaranteeing that the printer is going to output 100 characters at exactly the same point every time. So the answer is here, I don't know what that is. So what's going on here is, is we have this, what it's referred to as a handshake. We have to output the things and we sit here and we wait for that thing to change. And when that thing changes, we output another one and then we come back here. So this is what's called asynchronous, okay? We have to wait for something. We don't know when I've output the first 100 characters, I don't know how long it's gonna be until I can output the next 100 characters. Um, that's one example. Um, another example looks like this, and I think I may have discussed this one in class. Um, I have a class called microprocessors. What I've drawn here, here's a microprocessor there. That's a microprocessor chip. And here's another microprocessor chip. And what I want to do is, is I want to be able to send suppose a byte of information from this one over to this one. Well, what I do is, is I hook up a wire from one pin on one chip to the other, and it's gonna go this way. Now, what I have to do is, is there has to be agreement between these two things, okay, about how quickly I'm gonna be transferring information. And I might say the agreement might be that we will transmit We will transmit one bit um, for one millisecond. So again, what that means, okay, so down here is time. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm measuring off milliseconds here. So there's a millisecond. There's a millisecond. Remember, a millisecond is a thousandth of a second. So I do something like that. And let's suppose for a second that maybe I want to transmit a one, zero, one, zero. And let's suppose over here on the y-axis, here's zero. And over here, there's one. So if I wanted to transmit one, zero, one, zero, I might do something like this. So it's one, and then it's a zero. So I'm going to darken this up. And then it's a one, and then it's a zero. And I know this is a mess here, but I don't draw well. So you get the idea here. This is how I would send a one, zero, one, zero. But that's not the whole story here. The whole story here is, is typically you're going to transmit one byte at a time. One character. And remember, one byte is equal to eight bits. 
But what we're going to do is, is we're going to send this asynchronously. And what that means is, is that I'm going to send over a byte, and I'm not quite sure when I'm going to send over the next byte. Well, here's the way it works. On the sender side, what the sender does is, is the sender normally sends out a high signal. When it's doing nothing, it's sending a high signal. And you might be wondering, if it's doing nothing, why doesn't it send out a zero instead of a one? And the answer is, is as if it's sending out a one, at least if we're listening to it, then we know that it's working. Okay? If we were to say when the sender is doing nothing, if we all agreed that it would send out a zero, it would be hard for us to distinguish when the sender isn't sending anything versus the sender not working. I hope that makes sense. So this is this is idle over here. This is a, this is the sender doing nothing. When when the sender is getting ready to send something, it goes low and it stays low for one millisecond. I'm going to say one milli. And this thing over here is the start bit. In other words, what happens is, is if I'm the receiver, I'm watching, I, you could say I'm pulling the line. If I'm the receiver, I am pulling the input line, and I'm saying as long as I see a 1, nothing is happening. But once I see it go down to a 0, I go, okay, it's getting ready to send me a byte of information. And I know that it's sending me a start bit that's 1 millisecond. And then what's going to happen is, as I say, I know it's going to be sending me 8 bits so here's bit one, here's bit two, here's bit three, here's bit four, five, six, seven, and eight. And maybe what's going to happen, so remember, this is low. Maybe I should change colors here. That would really be cool, wouldn't it? So here's my low bit my start bit and then maybe it goes high and maybe it stays high for two and then it comes back low and maybe it stays low for two then maybe it goes high for one low for one high for one low for one and now that here's the key important thing, now it goes back high because I'm all done. And remember, here I am again, idle. So we can imagine that what we've sent here is, is we've sent a one, a one, a zero, a zero, a one, a zero, a one, and a zero. Then we go idle again. And here's what makes this whole thing asynchronous. So here is a byte of information. At some point, it's going to go low again. And here, this is my start bit again. But what I don't know is, is I don't know how long this is. And in asynchronous communication, I don't care. Okay, this could be three minutes. This could be two days. This could be a millisecond, okay? But the point is, is, is that I have no idea in between these, I have no idea how long the idle time is between bytes, okay? So this, is, this would be asynchronous. Okay, synchronous would mean that, again, we all know that computers have clock pulses in them. These are supposed to be even, in case you can't tell. Okay, synchronous means that we are always sending, we are always sending information. It could be either on a clock pulse, or it could be on every two clock pulses, or it could be on every four clock pulses. 
okay? But that there is a continuous stream of information that is tied to the clock. Synchronous communication typically are large packets of data. May involve many connections, many wires. Okay. Um, and you're going to see more synchronous communications in things like networks. Okay, I hope you're impressed with the colors. Um, that really, in the book, that gets us through 8.1. And I am going to post this video and probably put some homework assignments up there along with it. Okay.